Hey everyone, I hope y'all are having a great day and today I'm so excited to be reviewing The Winner's Crime by Marie Rutkowski. This is the second book in The Winner's Trilogy, the first being The Winner's Curse. In case you didn't know, The Winner's Curse was one of my favorite books of 2014, one of my favorite books of all time, really. I love this book so much. I do have a video review of The Winner's Curse up, and I also mentioned this book in my favorite books of 2014 video. I also mentioned The Winner's Crime in my most anticipated releases of 2015 video. So I think I've made it pretty clear that I really, really love this trilogy, but if you haven't heard, I love it. If this is your first time hearing about this trilogy, I'll tell you a little bit about it. The Winner's Curse basically revolves around a girl named Kestrel, who's the the daughter of the main general in the Valorian army, and she accidentally buys a slave. All the slaves are Hurani people. This book follows Kestrel and her slave as they gradually fall in love with each other, as well as the political tension between the Valorians and the Hurani. The second book, The Winner's Crime, definitely broadens the scope of the series. The second book definitely has a heavier political element to it, as all the characters are involved in politics and alliances. The Winner's Crime was definitely not what I was expecting at all. It constantly surprised me. And this installment definitely has a really different feel to the book than The Winner's Curse does. This book, in two words, is probably frustrating and painful. This book was really, really painful. Thinking about it makes me tear up. I personally didn't think The Winner's Crime was as great as The Winner's Curse, but I definitely know I'm in the minority when I say that, because when I go to Goodreads to see reviews of The Winner's Crime, everyone is like, Marie Rukowski totally stepped up her game, she improved so much. But in my eyes, the first book, The Winner's Curse, was perfection and you can't improve upon perfection. Like, I reread The Winner's Curse this past weekend in preparation of The Winner's Crime's release, and it only took me three pages to fall in love all over again. I think Marie Rutkowski's strengths are definitely her characters. They feel so real, and they draw out so many emotions from the reader. It's insane. And also, her writing style is gorgeous. Her words are just pure poetry. So I do love The Winner's Curse more than I love The Winner's Crime, but that being said, The Winner's Crime is still a fantastic book. Obviously, I'm very, very gushy about this trilogy. I love it so much. It's one of my favorites. And of course, I'm going to recommend it to you if you haven't read it yet. Read it. Read these books. So what if they ruin your life? So what if the endings of these books make you want to throw yourself off a cliff? So what after finishing one of these books, it feels like your soul has abandoned your body and found a new home in these pages? That doesn't matter, right? Just read these books. I'm going to discuss The Winner's Crime more in depth now, so if you haven't read it, I'm going to ask you to leave. Please read it please, 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 and then come back. Okay, so I hope people who haven't read The Winner's Crime are gone now. This story starts with Kestrel opening a letter from the Minister of Agriculture, Tenzin. Kestrel's clearly unhappy, and so am I. Kestrel has to marry the Emperor's heir in exchange for the freedom of the Harani people, and of course the Emperor turns out to be this huge dirt bag. Of course. Of course. Because when have we ever had a benevolent ruler in a fantasy book? We also get to meet the crown prince himself, Varix, who in my opinion was so irrelevant that I had to look up his name before I hit record. He was honestly nothing like I was expecting. I was either expecting him to be a ginormous asshole or super charming and thus initiating a love triangle. But luckily, Marie Rukowski avoided all of those cliches, and Varix just ended up being kind of like an equivalent to Kestrel. He's like Kestrel in the way that he knows he's a pawn in the Emperor's game, and he hates it. He has his own desires, and he hates being used. And Marie Rukowski, instead of making Varix an enemy or a love interest, she just makes him into a friend for Kestrel. By the end of the book, they're both willing to marry each other, platonically, and change the empire for the better when they finally have their chance to rule. But of course before that can happen, Kestrel is shipped off to a labor camp. Fantastic. We see Aaron as the governor of Haran, and it feels strange to me. It feels strange that someone so young is the leader of an entire people, but I suppose Aaron's the best fit for the job. Aaron doesn't know that Kestrel negotiated the treaty with the emperor, and by the end of the book, he still doesn't know. And that is the most frustrating thing Ever. I just, it was so frustrating. They had so many opportunities to just tell each other, and they never did. And it is. Uh... Anyway, Aaron goes to the capital for all the celebrations in preparation for Kestrel's engagement, and he arrives at the party. Kestrel goes to the balcony, and Aaron follows her into the balcony. And that whole scene, I feel like, should 
feel electric to me but instead I just felt really uncomfortable I feel like that scene felt a little bit too predatory and I was so scared that someone was going to walk in because Kestrel is obviously a very important character in the capital she's the empress to be the celebration is in her honor her and Varix's honor so she's a big deal and Everyone knows that there are rumors surrounding Kestrel and Aaron. So if I were the Emperor, I would constantly be keeping tabs on Kestrel's whereabouts, especially when Aaron walks in the door. Once Aaron's there, I wouldn't let Kestrel leave my sight. So I am, I'm just thinking that of course Kestrel's gonna be caught. Of course someone's gonna check up on her and she's gonna be there with Aaron, but that never happened and I just, it didn't really make sense to me. Why is Kestrel not being followed? Kestrel becomes a sort of spy for Tenzin, she becomes the moth, and there's this particular encounter where Aaron discovers Kestrel dressed up as one of the palace maids when she's outside of the palace, and it's after Aaron has been attacked, and so he has that scar, he has his stitches in, which by the way, it's, it's interesting to imagine that. But anyway, they play a game of bite and sting, like old times, and the prize is the truth. And I think every reader is rooting for Kestrel to lose because we're so sick of Aaron not knowing. And Kestrel loses. And Aaron stupidly asks Kestrel the wrong question. He asks her about the recent attack on the Eastern Plains. And at this point, I just want to burn the book because I'm so, so angry. The constant miscommunication between Kestrel and Aaron sets fire to my blood. I just want them to tell each other the truth and work out a plan together because they're both so smart. I'm sure they could figure something out to get out of their situation, but they, just, they don't tell each other anything. Anyway, and of course throughout the whole book, Kestrel is pretty lonely. Jess leaves her and Jess ignores her and this pisses me off because Kestrel saved Jess in the last book. Jess was poisoned and Kestrel made Aaron find the herb to save her. And yeah, I understand that Jess thinks Aaron is the one who caused all this monstrous disaster stuff to happen to her and her family and Ronan and everything, but Kestrel is your best friend and you're not even trying to listen to what she's saying. You don't even want an explanation. What kind of friend? I just, I can't. I'm obviously biased because I love Kestrel and Jess is kind of irrelevant, but it makes me sad that Kestrel is so alone and that her one friend, whose life she saved, BTW, ignores her and hates her and tells her to get out of her face. After Aaron finds out that Kestrel's the one who got the idea to poison the horses on the eastern plains, he leaves. He asks the emperor for permission to leave and he goes to the eastern country to ask for an alliance. The second the emperor mentioned how neat Aaron's stitches were, I knew that was the end for Delia and it was just a matter of time to see when she would die. Aaron goes east, talks to the queen and Rosha. Aaron does his thing over there trying to get them to ally with him and he invents the firearm? Question mark? I guess that's what happened. He made a mini cannon. He just, he made a gun. He invented it? What? I'm gonna be honest and say that I didn't really care about this storyline. I don't find the eastern lands interesting. I don't find Roshar or the queen interesting. I wanted to gag when Aaron and the queen were kissing. And just this whole plot line was not a jam for me. The last 50 pages or so of this book really, really made this book shine for me. It was just so intense. Everything was happening at once. I was tearing through the pages. Aaron finally figured out, like 400 pages too late, he figured out that Kestrel probably negotiated the treaty. She probably bargained herself in order to free the Harani people. And so he left the Eastern Lands, he was going back to the capital to finally demand the truth from Kestrel. And at this point I was so freaking tired of the prolonged miscommunication between them that could have been resolved so easily. I wanted to scream. And of course, of course, when Aaron wants to demand the truth from Kestrel, Kestrel can't say it because her father's listening in. Perfect. Ugh. And of course, Aaron is so impatient that he just snatches the pen out of Kestrel's hand before she can say that they're being observed. Ugh. And of course, Kestrel continues to put on her infuriating pretense that no, She's doing what she wants. Of course she would want to marry the Emperor's heir. Not everything revolves around you, Aaron. And she does this because she thinks it's the best thing to do. And that's what's really interesting, actually, about this book, is that in the first book, Kestrel is always right. She's explicitly characterized as this extremely intelligent strategist. Her strategies, her intelligence, her cunning, they're always really on point. But in this book, Marie Rukowski is building up this theme or 
maybe this motif, that Kestrel is still playing a game, but she's no longer the best player at the table. So she has so much to lose. There's such a high risk. But anyway, Kestrel continues to deny the truth. And Aaron, of course, lets his insecurities overwhelm him, and he believes her lie. It's all very New Moon. When Kestrel realized that her father was no longer in the screen room, I had this really, really, really bad feeling that her dad would betray her. Even though he had said, like, semi-kind words during that period when he was drugged, even though she was all he had left for family, I think I knew that he would choose the country over his daughter. And it hurts so much more because during that conversation between Kestrel and Aaron, Kestrel says, I love my father, and Aaron is, like, really surprised, and he's like, yeah, I know. Because it's obvious. It's obvious that Kestrel loves her father, and even though it's obvious, the general still goes and just tramples on that love until it's shattered. And that makes me feel so sad and heartbroken for Kestrel. So by the end of the book, Kestrel is being shipped to a labor camp. Aaron has to go fix the poisoning of Haran. He thinks Kestrel doesn't love him because A, Kestrel continued to lie to him, and B, Stupid Tenson stupidly refused to give this stupid letter to Aaron. I can't. It's so hard to imagine a happy ending for them at this point in the story because it seems like everything is just getting worse and worse and worse for them. They've been through so much and they still have to go through an entire book's events more. And even after this full book, Aaron is still blind to Kestrel's true feelings and it's just so frustrating. This is what I guess my ideal ending would be. Varix and Risha get married so that they can unite Valoria as well as the Eastern Land. Kestrel and Aaron get together and they somehow unite and heal the rift between Valorians and the Harani. Of course, the Emperor is killed or somehow taken care of so that he's removed from power. No one I love gets hurt and everyone lives happily ever after. I have no idea where the story is going to go from here, especially considering I wasn't expecting any of the events that played out in this book. Is Eren going to save Kestrel from the labor camp or is Kestrel going to save herself? Back in the capital, is Varric going to do something after he realizes that Kestrel is gone? Is he going to finally step up and act like a ruler? Is Risha actually and finally going to assassinate the emperor? Book three is called The Winner's Kiss. And yeah, that breaks the sea scheme, but Marie Rutkowski has promised kissing and war. Hopefully, kissing indicates a happy ending where Aaron and Kestrel get together. Because really, Kestrel and Aaron have been battered so much by Marie Rukowski's ruthless manipulation to the point where I don't even know how they keep themselves going. And then Marie Rukowski has also promised war, which indicates pain. So the winner's crime was really surprising. It was nothing like I thought it would be. The writing was gorgeous as usual. I don't think it was quite as tight, not quite as pithy as the writing was in The Winner's Curse, but it was still beautiful. The way Marie Rukowski writes about her characters and the way she writes her plot, it just forces you to feel tension and anxiety and frustration. It's like you can feel her hands going in and twisting your gut and like choking your heart. I barely survived this book and I'm so scared for book three because I cannot handle any more pain. So that's it for me. Tell me your thoughts on The Winner's Crime. It was such a frustrating and painful book, but I thought it did a fantastic job of building up this trilogy. I love this series so much. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day and happy reading. Goodbye!